We have a very special guest returning here today, Hans Nelson. How have you been? Uh, glad to have you back here to participate in the 10 question game. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, it's been a, a man, a crazy year and some change since we last spoke. A lot has uh, developed over that time. I'm very excited about the 1010 Robo Taxi event coming up. And uh, yeah, looking forward to just speculating here. Uh, trying to get warmed up for what it is that we're about to see. All right. Well, I want to hold off just a minute on the 10 questions that you've developed to add to the rest uh, with a couple of just quick questions for you about the, the important things that are coming up. So number one, um, folks are really have a wide range of guesses for next Wednesday for the numbers uh, uh, game, <laughs> everywhere from under six, 460 to over 485. Uh, where are you in that? Where are you in that range? How do you think we're going to do next Wednesday? Um, I haven't really tracked it very oh, closely. I think that China's doing really well. Um, so I would say let's let's shoot for closer to the four eighty five mark, and uh, hope that our optimism is rewarded. We're we're hoping that AJ is right. All right, number yeah. two, <laughs> um, price targets seem to be moving up. Do you have any price targets? Uh, for later this year and next? I don't really, yeah, track the stock price super closely. And I don't do near-term price targets. I think that the long-term, I, th I think it's likely that we're going to stagnate here and bounce around a little bit for the next couple of years until we see major profits flow through to the bottom line from RoboTaxi. And so that, it will really depend, like when we break out, will depend on either energy revenues just like massively flowing through to the bottom line or software revenues massively flowing through to the bottom line. So whatever we see from the RoboTaxi event will kind of influence what the timelines look like on when we should expect software revenues to, to really hit. Interesting. All right. And then lastly, what do you think will happen on 1010? Well, this is where, you know, things obviously start to get a little bit more interesting um, I have, you know, I think about the possible, basically, uh, what are the things that I'm hoping that they'll learn or the uh, areas where I'm expecting them to potentially comment. And so I, I broke it into hardware, software, and infrastructure. I think we could learn interesting things on, you know, any number of those fronts. So we haven't gotten an update on manufacturing in the unbox process for quite some time now. And if they're talking about the RoboTaxi, it's very possible that they could talk about the unbox process. And since we've heard that they're going to do the uh, intermediate models that are the cheaper models that are not all the way to unboxed manufacturing, that leads me to believe that the RoboTaxi specifically is going to be the first car that is manufactured with the fully unboxed process. And since 1010 is a RoboTaxi event, we might get some insight into what unbox manufacturing evolution has produced, you know, since we last heard about that. Um, that would be an exciting piece of information. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of implications. One of the things that I expect from 1010 is they're really going to focus on the RoboTaxi platform, and they're not going to give us a lot of details on the $25,000 car because I think we're getting very close to the actual release of that $25,000 car. And so, you know, they're going to hold out the shiny object of the RoboTaxi, which is still a little bit further down the road. And that's going to be, you know, look at the left hand while the right hand is getting ready to deliver these cheaper vehicles that are going to be manufactured from Austin. Um, so I don't expect to get a whole lot of direct information on the new cheaper models of Teslas that are not going to be RoboTaxi first platforms. Um, but instead, I think that we will learn information about where we're going from with the RoboTaxi that we can then infer back some implications on what that means for those cheaper intermediate models as well. Um, that's... Uh, that's one, you know, vector of the this 
progress that I'm looking to get some information on. The, uh, the other thing is wireless charging. Um, I think that wireless charging is something that it is probably a big part of how a robo-taxi fleet operates. Wow. And we've been seeing patents on that here recently. And uh, so I think it's also possible that we'll get some information about how they're planning to do charging of robo-taxi fleets using the wireless charging. Um, and that's all on the hardware front. So then if we move over to software, I think that, you know, there's probably going to be information about the commercial FSD software where we should see the app. We might even get some insight into business models for people operating fleets, um, their potential fleet management platform, um, if we did get any information like that, I think it would be kind of sparse, yeah. but that would be a very high level thing that it would make sense for them to comment on. Um, also potentially partnerships that, or maybe invitations for commercial partners to work on or, you know, start developing a relationship with Tesla on specific things. Right. Um, then for, you know, we've seen a lot of, basically, if you think about the uh, the post from Tesla autopilot team that had all the list of things that they were trying to deliver in September and October, I think that all those milestones were things that they're planning, that the reason that October was the cutoff, it said, you know, September, October, and then it jumped to Q1 of next year. I think the reason that October was the cutoff is because all of those individual pieces of software were planned to play some part of whatever the demo is on 1010. Okay. Um, and so I think that's the consumer side of FSD that we should see progress on rollouts of version 12, potentially even version 13. And if I remember correctly, uh, you might remember, didn't Elon say that version 12 will eventually they're they're going to hold on to the 12 handle until fsd becomes unsupervised there was something like that it was what it was it was not as it was that so clear cut as that it was more like maybe we will or something anyway i can't remember exactly but yeah anything's possible and who knows maybe we skip 13 well yeah that's going to be interesting so i think we're definitely going to learn a lot about just FSD in general, yeah. um, portions of that will be applicable to us now. And then other parts of that are obviously going to be portions that are saved for a commercial robo taxi ride hailing fleet. Um, and, and whatever we learn on that front, I'm super excited about. Uh, I think the last time we spoke, we had talked about the potential for FSD to be sold uh, to customers at a variety of price points with a variety of pieces of functionality, kind of as an in-between step from here to full robo-taxi, you know, level four, level five capability. Um, we may see some indications of something like that. I don't know. It, it seems like Tesla still hasn't reached a point in the safety of the overall system um, to where they're super comfortable with something like that, which uh, they they've been offering the free trials without necessarily going super super wide. So it's uh, you know I got it half right on part of that, but there's there's still some uh, some pieces left over that they're not really fully on board with um, splitting things up and and it could just be that we're so close to actually being able to achieve level four level five in their mind that they're saying we're just going to go all the way you know pedal to the metal for the full robo taxi business model. Um, and then we'll have to wait and see what they do for just consumers who aren't really interested in uh, contributing their vehicles to the robo taxi network. Um, Cause I think there is, you know, there's going to be a portion of the fleet that doesn't necessarily want to participate in the robo taxi network. Oh, who, lots. lots. Yeah. yeah <clears throat> they're, that would it leave an open opportunity to try and monetize those vehicles for customers using FSD 
at a higher rate. So whether that's, you know, offering per mile pricing or, you know, more of an a la carte menu of features and functionality, like, do you want actually smart summon? And that's going to be, you know, an upcharge versus just FSD on highways versus, you know, those types of options to really maximize the extraction of value from that portion of the fleet that doesn't participate in, in robo taxis. Um, but yeah, that's all of that. I don't really expect to see on 1010. I think the, the focus is really just going to be straightforward robo taxis on 1010. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Very different than some of the rest of my regular co-hosts and guests. All right. So let's talk about your 10 questions. So uh, we've had about 75 or 80, I forget how many now, questions so far. So I'm going to be very interested to hear what you can add to the mix. So uh, go ahead, question, what's your first, if you had Elon Musk in front of you right now, what would be your, and I don't know, is there any order to these? Um. Well, yeah, so I, I guess the questions that I have are kind of aligned with, um, are we talking about just questions for 1010 or questions for Elon Musk in general? They could be questions for 1010. They could be questions for earnings day. They could be questions just because you got the benefit of having them on your channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, so one of the, the, this is probably a tangential question that most people won't connect with, but I'm always fascinated by, um, there's a couple of individual organizations over the course of the last hundred years, who've had a huge impact on the development of technology overall. Uh, one of those would be Bell Labs, obviously, but another one of them is gonna be Skunk Works, which was run by a gentleman named Kelly Johnson at Lockheed Martin and obviously produced the SR-71 Blackbird. But you know, Kelly Johnson really oversaw not that project, but the other project, which was the A-12 Archangel, which is the prototype version of the SR-71 Blackbird, which Elon has obviously huge fascination with and love for. And uh, so I'm always curious to know, you know, what has he learned about life, engineering, project management, and technological development from Kelly Johnson and Skunk Works specifically through his love of that project? Um, because, you know, Kelly Johnson was a very innovative character operating inside of, you know, a government bureaucracy and created this, like, uh, I mean, we use the word skunk works now yeah, to of. describe what that was, you know, it's just this incubator of innovation and progress and execution that is able to survive inside of, you know, a big bureaucratic institution like the government that is very exceptional at not getting things done. All right. So that would be a very broad question. Sounds to me like it would take him, uh, if he did a, if he did it justice, probably take him at least an hour to answer that one. <laughs> but very good one. It sounds sounds like a lot of what I did in the Elon Musk method, but not I wasn't specific mm -hmm. to Skunk Works. But kind of how does he think? What is this yep. proponeurial brain? Uh, and how does it differ from the normal human brain? Um, and uh, and what and what are his specific skill sets too? that cause him to be just beyond uh, anybody's understanding of how entrepreneurs usually perform. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Cause you know, it seems like he's really taken it a step farther and, and his business success owes to essentially creating entire organizations that operate yes. with the efficacy of a skunk works. So it's like running a skunk works project at the scale of hundreds of thousands of employees, which yeah you know, is an exceptional accomplishment, obviously. Um, and yeah, that, so what is the relationship and what, you know, what things did he learn from Kelly Johnson and then what rules from Kelly Johnson did he have to completely break and throw out the window in order to scale that up to such a large, incredible organization? All right. Question number two. Um, yeah, definitely would start with robo taxi for the time being, since, uh, I think, you know, that's, that's a, thing that we'll actually get answers to here in the near future is, uh, you know, are we just pushing all the way to robo taxis? Um, or is there, you know, a stair stepped rollout plan uh, between here and there? And really digging into, he, he had a great interview with um, 
you know, the all in podcast a couple of weeks ago, talking about the difference of the type of software challenge that real world AI is compared to these LLMs. And um, so I'd be curious to hear him comment on Dojo and just the infrastructure compute build out that's going to be necessary to continue to solve. Yes. Yeah. So the the dojo build out. Okay. And and the compute needs to really solve real world applied AI, both for full self-driving, but also for the bot, you know, over the next decade. Um, He thinks that the third version of Dojo might be the one that finally is a really good standalone product that is able to compete more effectively against uh, NVIDIA's chips because Jensen is, you know, such an incredible entrepreneur and has been able to keep up with the types of pace of progress that uh, Elon has been trying to make on the chips and AI front in house. Um, So that's, you know, that would definitely be another one. When when when, um, when do you think that that third iteration will be uh, produced? So it aligns with he he said there's a I think one in 2025 that he was talking about, about being version two of Dojo. Um, then TSMC has talked about so we know that Dojo is produced by TMC TSMC. We know that it is produced using uh, a special process that they have developed that allows them to do, you know, where the Dojo D1 tiles are 25, you know, individual chips that are all kind of smushed together on one wafer. Um, The process that allows them to do that is a special process that TSMC pioneered and the Dojo chip is the first chip that actually takes advantage of that process. So they have said that there's a new evolution of that process that then allows them to put further chips on top of the, you know, you've got the the 25 individual D1 tiles on the wafer. So they can also put chips on top of those individual 25 D1 tiles. Right. Right. Um, and so that would allow them to co-locate things like the high bandwidth memory mm. right on top of the chips instead of having to go off chip to reach these pieces mm. of memory. That process is slated to come online in late 2026, early 2027, from uh, what I remember uh, off the top of my head from a couple months ago when TSMC had an event. And that aligns with when Elon says that the Dojo version three is going to come out. So Dojo version two is going to be a second iteration of Dojo, but it's going to use the same process that the current version of Dojo uses Dojo version three, I think, is going to use that next generation process from TSMC. And um, that was supposed to provide up to a 40x increase in performance, according to TSMC, in comparison to the Dojo D, the, the version one of Dojo. Um, so, you know, that that's pretty large. We may see an increase of, you know, it could be like a five times increase from Dojo V1 to Dojo V2. And then from there, like an eight to 10 times increase from Dojo V2 to Dojo V3. And that's where things really start to get interesting. Um, yeah, so that, that's 2027 is probably the time frame to expect Dojo V3. Assuming you know, TSMC is pretty good about their timelines. They, they dif- don't typically have delays. Um, and that being the case, you know, as long as we don't have a Chinese invasion of Taiwan between now and then, then I think that we could probably look to see, yeah, version three of Dojo's being an exceptional chip in 2027 that uh, Tesla's starting to roll out and implement. A a conversation for another day, but I have this theory after watching all of what's taking place in Israel and uh, and with the massive uh, infrastructure underground that given that Taiwan is so mountainous, I just have this picture of Taiwan having by far the most massive underground infrastructure ever in history, and that they're building drones by the millions in factories underground, <laughs> and that China will be very surprised if they ever do attempt 
<laughs> to take over Taiwan. That's my picture anyway. I don't know if that's a movie <laughs> or a script, but we'll we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever happens, we definitely know that drones will be a big factor yeah. in whatever that conflict looks like. Um, and yeah, I, I I anticipate that whatever's going on there, both sides know. You know, I, I think that the uh, intelligence gathering capabilities of both sides is good enough to pretty much know what they're kind of getting into uh, either way. So yeah, it, it'll be... The next 10 years is going to be really insane just on a whole number of fronts. All right. Question number four. Um, Got to go back to batteries that, you know, we've definitely seen a slowdown in a lot of the plans of a lot of OEMs. It also took longer for Tesla to be able to achieve both cathode and anode production using their dry cathode process. Um, so commercializing Maxwell technology, you know, has, has taken a little bit longer. And I think that takes a lot of the um, pressure off of lithium mining that, you know, there was going to be potentially in the back half of this decade. And so, yeah, I'd be curious, you know, if, if everything went well, where does he see battery production in 2030 and how does that correlate to the 20,000 or I mean, 20 million vehicle target that was originally given? You know, I, he, we haven't heard him reiterate that in a long time. And I don't think that that is the target, um, but it would be it would be interesting to hear. More in line with, you know, what they talked about with Master Plan Part 3, like how much battery supply for Master Plan Part 3 goals can we really expect in um in 2030 given the final you know the breakthroughs that we're seeing in 4680s now the more exponential ramp hopefully that we're going to see in that and um then the rollout of more commercial vehicles like semi and cyber truck finally hitting the roads uh that would be a big one um yeah. obviously XAI. So we'll we'll move on to the next question. Okay. The uh, you know, what what is the future of XAI and its relationship with all the different Elon Musk entities? So obviously XAI and X, but XAI and Tesla. I think that there's you know, Elon's really pursuing the future of artificial intelligence. Um in so real world intelligence being with Tesla and then just traditional LLM traditional. research. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. With, yeah. Well, I mean, it's at least five years old now. Right. So <clears throat> doing more of the chat GPT style uh, development of AI with XAI. And those are really, you know, two different non-correlated bets that are both aimed at kind of the same overall goal. And I'm curious how he thinks about the relationship between those two things long term, um, how that fits into the plans to colonize Mars uh, <laughs> with SpaceX, and uh, and really, you know, bringing in. So here, this is a super nerdy question um, that I would love to get an answer to. I want to know: Has Elon? assigned a task force to investigate putting data centers in orbit with SpaceX instead of having them here on Earth. Uh, just because, you know, there are huge engineering challenges. Cooling things in space is definitely possible. It's not easy. Data centers are hard to cool. Uh, but you can also put a lot of solar panels on satellites in orbit and they can get electricity from the sun for free. And, you know, because they don't have all that atmosphere inhibiting the sunlight, you know, from the surface of the atmosphere all the way to the surface of the earth, they run it, you know, much higher. You're there. They're able to pull a lot more energy from the solar radiation than we get here right. at the surface of the earth. And so you could potentially run your, your data centers at a lower amount of like your energy input cost can potentially be lower then uh and you can run them 24/7 if you put them in specific 
orbits that are um, basically facing the sun 24 hours sure. a day. Sure, sure. So I think that would be an interesting one. Um, and he would definitely be the type of person to think about it. He has all the resources between yeah. SpaceX and XAI. Like, um, it, it's a concept that gets kind of thrown out there. And, and I'd be curious to know his thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah. You and Brian Wong need to get together and to think that one through. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so I, what is that? Maybe six that we've done? Six um, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lost a little track. Yep. Man, past that, I mean, there there are so many things that you definitely could ask. Um, I think just to go back to the RoboTaxi event questions, what is the design of, we'll say, yeah, the, the, the questions I'm hoping to get answered on 1010 is Franz has talked so much, you know, so many times over the last couple of years about how excited he is to be designing the project that he's working on, which we expect is the RoboTaxi. So what is the design of these RoboTaxi platforms? How many form factors do we get? You know, is it just two seaters? Is it also two seaters, four seaters, pickup trucks, vans, semis, you know, all these things like getting a peek into the future of automated transport, um, not only for humans, but you know, also for goods, uh, yeah. that is a big open question that I, I can't wait. And then, like I said, I think we're going to get a lot of answers to that here very soon. So, yeah. So you think, so the platform question is one that's just absolutely fascinating. If it is, if that's what they're working on is either one or two platforms. It's a little hard. That's a, I think that was on my list of questions actually is, is, is there one platform or is there a, subcompact platform and a cyber cab platform and are those two different things and then what will fit on one or both of those platforms you 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 gave the list i don't have to, i don't have to repeat it but a you know pickup truck and a van you know is i think maybe on everybody's list of things that seem like uh you know you would want to be able to offer uh and in the van we're not just talking about mom's van you know for taking the kids out but uh, commercial vans um, as well. Yeah, so, which is the biggest, you know, um, market for vans is not for, you know, moms of any sort. It's for people who are driving delivery routes or business owners or, you know, all those things. And uh, yeah, and a, a whole variety of sizes. You know, you have little tiny vans that are built basically on the chassis of a Ford Focus all the way up to giant vans that are, you know, built on a chassis that's bigger than an F-350 and, uh, and everything in between. Yeah. Lots and lots and lots of opportunities there. Yeah. So those are, you, you, you've, that is definitely one that I'm extremely curious about. Yeah. Yeah. So what else? Is there anything else on your list? I mean, uh, probably to, to touch on a question we discussed a little bit before we hopped on was, uh, how hard is the Optimus software challenge yeah. compared to the FSD software challenge. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're still pouring a lot of resources and time and effort into finishing development of FSD. But really, when you step back and you think about it, FSD is one narrow application of real world AI. intelligence and AI. And we are going to have a whole bunch more of those narrowly applied um fields to then go and tackle and uh yeah so how are we going to slice and dice the I, I think there's so much room wide open in the humanoid robot market for different business models different approaches um and different people to be successful i'm curious to see how elon and tesla specifically are thinking about their their go-to-market strategy and based on all the learning that they've had trying to develop FSD as a product, um, what are the next steps of software development for Optimus specifically? You know, most of what they've given us about Optimus up to this point is really about hardware and manufacturability. Um, they've hinted at how they're developing software, but they haven't really told us. And they say that, you know, everything that we've learned from FSD is applicable right. to developing the software 
for the Optimus robot, but I think that it may be 5% or 10%, you know, optimistically of all of the stuff that needs to get built to make, you know, humanoid robot platforms as a, as a general tool applicable to, you know, general problems for humans. Um, I, I think that we've only begun the software lift to accomplish that. And uh, so that that's going to be another huge, and really that, that leads into the biggest market opportunities for Tesla and the transformations of our world. I think, you know, robo taxis are big, but transforming the entire workforce is, you know, orders of magnitude bigger. Yeah, yeah, it's no no doubt about it. And um, you know, one of my big surprises in as all of this has moved along has been this idea. I mean, that it shouldn't be a surprise, but it was. But I'm not in that world, right? Is this idea that you teach the robot first how to do seven basic tasks, and then there's these hundred basic tasks that are on top of the seven basic tasks, and so you're kind of training almost like a human is trained to squeeze or to lift up or to put down or to push or to pull you know there's a basic basic tasks and then once you once the robot knows how to do these whatever it is 100 basic tasks you can layer on very specific tasks and of course the beauty of it is every robot in the entire fleet gets that that training at the same time that one does. Um, so is how far along do you think they were, might, might be on this basic task learning or do you think they're approaching it differently than that? Um, yeah, I think that they're probably decently far along in the basic tasks, but even, you know, for basic tasks, when you think about the infinite variations that we just kind of do of that basic task and we're able to, you know, abstract it and, and apply it instantly without even thinking about it. Um, I think we have some machine learning breakthroughs in order to achieve that sort of capability to convert a, you know, a basic skill into an abstract skill that is easily applied, you know, in different environments and different lighting with different objects and, and all these things. Um, so I look at that as a challenge. I also look at the AI, even if we say the AI five inference computer in Optimus with a single chip, you know, its ability to run inference is going to be dramatically lower than a human's inference capabilities. And so what that means is the amount of compute that you have to have in the cloud in order to provide Optimus with super general and fast inference um, is an order of magnitude even higher. And so, yeah, it really drives a need for just massive amounts of compute. Um, I will be surprised if we can really start making huge progress on the Dojo front or on the Optimus front without Dojo V3 uh, level capabilities and whatever NVIDIA's you know equivalent at that point in time is. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that raises challenges and that's why I'm curious, you know, how, how Tesla's thinking about this, what's the progress that they've achieved so far and, and how much do they expect this to, you know, their progress to be something that they can even really forecast well, you know, I think that the Optimus challenges are like we said, the, the opportunity for Optimus is an order of magnitude greater than the opportunity for full self-driving. I think the challenges for Optimus are probably a magnitude greater as well. Um, but we do have an exponential ability to solve problems. So I think that the delays that we see in the Optimus rollout are probably going to be, you know, roughly in specific number of years, similar to the types of delays that we've seen in FSD over the last five, six years. So did you have any questions on the energy storage side? Um, not a whole lot. I, you know, it's going to be the, the hard thing about energy is, is really twofold. Um, 
regulatory environment is awful on that front. And that's the thing that is going to be slowing down mega pack ramp more than anything else, especially with current lithium prices and current battery prices. Like the bottleneck that we're seeing is just that there are people that have projects planned and they can't start the project until all the rubber stamps get applied. So um, that's difficult. Then the other piece is that uh, there are, you know, it's not that complicated of a technology. And so you actually do have a lot of competitive pressure from other companies making products, especially within China, which is like China's the big energy growth market. It's bigger than, you know, the, the United States by, by far. And so within China, which is one of the main areas where, you know, they're trying to grow energy deployment, um, they face competition. Uh, I think that their software is an order of magnitude probably better than any of their competitors. So that should give them an edge long term. Um, so I am really going to watch closely what the Megapack factory in Shanghai does. And, and we should just be able to watch, like, you know, they're going to install the first factory. Do they continue to grow that? Fa like, they're going to have room on that site to grow. So if we see them pretty consistently adding on to the factory, will know that they're able to, you know, successfully sell that product pretty well in China. Um, beyond that, the, you know, it really raises the question of regular, and this would be a another good question for Elon. Like we're watching him right now go toe to toe with the administrator of the FAA. That doesn't seem like a, an effective strategy to accelerate your cooperation with uh, the FAA to get things done more quickly. But, you know, sometimes you have to play nice and sometimes you have to play hardball. And so really the, the big question, how is Elon thinking about fighting the regulatory burden fight across <laughs> the globe on all these different fronts, uh, you know, over the next couple of decades, he faces that with SpaceX. He faces that with Tesla. We're going to see that with RoboTaxi rollout. There's also going to be a bunch of regulatory red tape when we get to Optimus. Like yeah. deployments of large fleets of these things is definitely going to be met with a bunch of pushback. Um, so yeah, that's that's big. If we can figure out how to accelerate the regulatory acceptance of mega pack projects in more jurisdictions. Um, I think that would make me more excited about energy as a business line for, for Tesla. Um, but I haven't seen any movement that makes me hopeful that we can speed up these projects uh, other than, well, I'll say except for the, announcement that we just got that they're going to try and push through reopening three mile Island right. uh, for nukes uh, yeah. and that Microsoft has kind of taken that on. Yeah. And so, you know, potentially if, uh, if that project can rapidly come to fruition, that really opens the doors for a lot of other energy projects as well, which will be a, a knock on effect for mega pack. Yeah. General electric, uh, one of their C one of their, uh, subsidiary um, executive, top executives, the uh, the energy side of it, did a nice uh, interview yesterday. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, and he was talking about they're ramping nuclear like crazy there. Uh, they're, they're, they expect nuclear to be a real, a real business by 2031. Um, they see, they feel that natural gas, I do too. Natural gas will still be a very important part of their business for another two decades. Uh, but uh, they are they are going crazy on nuclear uh, on the modular you know mini nukes. That's where it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be great if we could finally you know get out of our own way when it comes to nuclear energy because it it just makes so much sense for base load generation. Uh, yeah, it, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, so uh, the the one big one that you didn't have a single question about was the uh, was the semi trucks. Um, that's you know number two for me after after Optimus is always semi because I just feel like the impact is going to be. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Brian Wong's work, 
you know, on the impact on pricing on the, you know, the cost of everything that you ever, every physical object in your world will drop in price um, as, yeah. as the, uh, as the, as the semis come on board. Um, did you have any questions uh, about semis that you'd like to? I feel like semis in the bag. Um, the only bottlenecks, like the, the product is there. Um, the engineering talent is there. They will, you, the only reason we haven't seen faster rollout of this is because we've had a 4680 bottleneck. I think the 4680 bottleneck is being solved as we speak. And that's why all of a sudden now we're seeing progress again on semi. So yeah, I think the semi project is in the bag. My only big question about it is the, um, you know, what is it going to look like to really get FSD running yeah. on these autonomous semis? Because that's, you know, getting electric semis is great. Huge. Getting autonomous electric semis, that's where all of a sudden you start looking at transport that's cheaper than rail. And really, that's where the prices of everything that has to be transported all around the world, you know, really comes down pretty significantly. And uh, so, yeah, my, my question about semi is what's the what's the progress on getting FSD? And we know what they're working on it because we've seen um, semis that we're driving around with LIDAR. Yeah. We know from Andre Karpathy that they use LIDAR during training for the yes. FSD systems in order to do validation on them. And that that's part of, you know, the, the process that they use to develop FSD for a specific vehicle. Um, and so we know that they're working on that and yeah. So what's the progress, what's the timeline. And, uh, I think we'll, but really a lot of that, they're not going to answer fully. We'll just have to imply it from what we learn on 1010. All right. Well, I know you have a hard cutoff in seven minutes, so I have just enough time to ask you my new favorite issue that I just dreamt up the other day while I was preparing my questions for this big question deal. And that is, okay, how do we now uh, develop an entire almost new division of Tesla called Tesla AI, which would have four products. It would sell Dojo chips in competition with NVIDIA. It would sell Dojo as a service in the cloud, which has already been mentioned by Elon. It would sell inference chips for other cars and robots because they have the best inference chip by far. And then we know also about this business of having the cloud in, in, the, in those inference chips, having the largest inference chip computer in the world that you could sell uh, time on that as well. So those are the first four products that come to mind, but those four together would be a massive, massive business. Do you see that as a future, a future of another future of Tesla that could be another one of the biggest companies in the world all by itself? Oh, they definitely could be. The question is whether they will develop those resources at a faster rate than they can use them to where there's any excess capacity to sell them, you know, outside the company. Right. Um, there are, so like inference is obviously a huge market. I, there's a couple of players that I'm really excited about. Cerebras is one. Um, Grok Inc. is one. And then at some point, uh, Jim Keller was one of the chip architects that worked for Tesla. He previously worked for Apple. Uh, he's worked for a whole bunch of companies. He started a company called TensTorrent. And so between them and what um, George... Potts is working on with TinyGrad. I'm, I'm very curious to just watch the inference market evolve. I think all of those players will uh, potentially have a large impact on what that ends up looking like. And um, it's going to be like inference is going to be super, super, super competitive. So the question is whether how much demand is there for distributed inference versus cloud inference. Um, and if distributed inference ends up being a large market, then Tesla really has an advantage with their inference chips. If the market trend goes the other way and it ends up being a lot of cloud inference instead of inference at the edge, um, then that really pushes the market away from what Tesla's developing. 
that's just on the inference side. On the dojo side, uh, I think that video-based training is going to be a larger and larger component of AI training long-term. And I think that dojo is in the pole position to be the best video training hardware setup in existence. Um, so dojo, you know, like Elon says, it's a, it's a moonshot, you know, big risks. It may not pay off, but if it does, I, I think that one's going to be huge. Um, then let's see. So that was the, the dojo chips and the inference chips. What were the other two you said? So you're talking about running a distributed inference cloud. I think, yeah. So that one, right. um, is tied up with how effective I think running a distributed inference cloud is going to be super difficult technically. I think it's going to be very hard for that to compete on a unit economics basis with centralized cloud inference. Um, so that one I'm less excited about. And then what was your what was your fourth one? <laughs> Maybe it was the inference chips themselves to go into the robots and into the cars. Did we talk? Yeah, so that definitely, you know, a, a big advantage there right now. Um, that, like I said, that will be a very competitive market. Uh, they they so have- That's the one you were talking, okay. So that's yeah. the one you're saying. But there's a, but it'll be a huge market. And yes, is it is it easy to think about it? I mean, if Tesla decided that they wanted I'm, to sell them, would anybody really be able to come close to them in terms? They've been working on this for years now. Nvidia has a big advantage right here, not necessarily because they have the best inference chips, but because they have the best developer platform for inference chips. And that is something that Tesla does not have. You know, they're not super developer friendly. Right. Right. Um, they don't have the infrastructure in place, the culture, the support staff, all of all of that. Um, so it would be hard not, you know, like their chips are good enough, but there's a lot of other challenges in, you know, being able to sell inference, basically edge inference devices at scale um, that I don't see even though it's a big opportunity, uh, it's going to be a big business segment. I don't see the risk reward for Tesla being worth it to allocate a ton of resources to solving all those problems that are really different kinds of problems than right. Tesla already has a core competency in. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. I'm going to be off. I'm going to miss my cutoff here. Hans, thank you so much for coming on board. You should definitely go watch him. Now, do you have, you still have your channel, but you're always yes. on Farzads. So <laughs> yeah, we do our, our podcast uh, a couple times a week. Usually uh, sometimes we talk about Tesla. A lot of times we don't. And uh, then, yeah, I have a, a channel where I, I also appear on Herbert's channel and the Herbert, Tesla owners right. of Silicon Valley stream as well. I clip those appearances and put them on my channel. Um, and I'm on X at Hansi Nelson. Hey, don't hesitate to clip a piece of this and or a couple of pieces of it and put it on your channel. That'd be great. All right. And anything else they should, should they be looking for you over on Patreon or, or following you on X, all those things? If they'd like to support me on Patreon, that would be great. Also there at Hansi Nelson. Um, yeah, I've got a, a nice little group of people that have been super generous there and I really appreciate that support. Um, but you know, the biggest thing is if you, you find the work that I do or the the content that I create valuable. Um, yeah, just engage with it and share it with your friends. That's really the, the most helpful thing that anyone could do. All right, great. Thank you so much for helping us with our thousand question thing that we're putting together here. <laughs> and to all of you out there, it has been great talking to you.